Here is another in NBC's great parade of new shows. As Richard Diamond, private detective. Hello there, this is Diamond. I'm a private detective. And as long as I've been in this business, I've found only four things that really make this racket worthwhile women, money, women, and more money. Those, don't misunderstand me, I've got other habits too. I, uh, I drink lots of milk, go to the fights. Dance the uh, meanest rumbo west of Ebbets Field and write fan letters to June Allison. But no matter how you slice it up, it still boils down to the same ghastly facts. To drink the gallons of milk, you've got to have loot. To go to the fights, you've still got to have it. But you add a little, uh, a little something, or a big something, as the case may be. That's right, a woman. Then if you're going dancing, you like to go to a nice place. Nice place? That's an 8 by 10 dance floor supported by bodies of patrons who couldn't pay the $12 minimum. So now you get into more money and there you are. Women, money, more women and more money. About the fan letters to June Allison? No, oh, who knows? She never writes back anyway. To show you how I make this money that gets me into so much trouble, let me tell you about a case I got mixed up in. It all started last week during a seance. Quiet, please, quiet. Now, if you will please place your hands on the table, Mrs. Van Dyke. Lightly, just the fingers touching. Oh, Dr. Langley, I'm so excited. Please, Mrs. Van Dyke. The professor must have complete silence. Oh, I'm sorry, but what's he doing? Uh, He's going into his trance. Uh, Dr. Langley. He's contacted the outer circle. I feel your presence. Who are you? Mama. Mama. Doctor, that voice is calling me. Not too loud. You'll break the contact. But men is my first Shh. name. Listen. Spirit, speak again. Who are you? I am Lillian Van Dyke. Oh, that's mother. 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 Mrs. Van Dyke, you must relax. If you continue to disturb the contact, your mother will leave. I'm sorry. Oh, Spirit, I feel that you have a message for someone in this room. Spirit, have you such a message? I have. Then speak. My love. Oh, yes, Mother. You are in grave danger. God yourself. Rely on Dr. Langley. He will help. Yes, Mother. What else? Mother? Oh. Uh. Contact has been broken. The mother will not return again today. Oh, will I be able to speak with her again, Professor? I must speak with her again. She said I was in some kind of danger. If you will return here tomorrow, Mrs. Van Dyke. Mother said to rely on you, Doctor. I intend to. I assure you, your confidence will be rewarded, Mrs. Van Dyke. In the meantime, I suggest you go home and get some rest. Yes, this experience has been rather trying. Goodbye, Professor. I shall see you tomorrow. Until tomorrow, dear lady. Coming, doctor? Uh, I wish to consult with the professor for a moment. I'll be right along. Very well, doctor. I'll wait in the car. Goodbye again, professor, and bless you. Goodbye, and bless you, you old goat. Take it easy. Really, she gets out the front door. Okay. Now, look, Langley, when are we going to pull the job? I'm getting tired of drumming up banshees for old money bags. Let's get those jewels. Look, tomorrow her mother is going to tell her that someone is after her precious jewel collection. Tell her? She'll lock him up in Fort Knox if that happens. Oh, I'm surprised at you, Professor. What if her dear old departed mother tells her to leave them with me for safekeeping? I get it. By the time she gets wise, we'll be in Mexico. <laughs> right. I'll see you tomorrow morning before Van Dyke gets here. We'll plan what we want the voice to say. And for Pete's sake, tell that old witch to sound like a ghost for a change. She came on today like Apple Mary with a hangover. Mr. Dunn? That's right. 
Come on in, but watch the clothesline. Oh, you've been washing. Aren't these a little loud? You should stop around when I'm doing socks. Uh, my name is Van Dyke, Mr. Diamond. Nancy Van Dyke. Miss? Mm-hmm. Well, bully for our side. What can I do for you, Miss Van Dyke? I'm worried about my aunt, Mr. Diamond. Why? Is she playing shortstop for Brooklyn? I don't think I understand that. You're not alone, but I have to keep trying. Uh, why are you worried about your aunt, Miss Van Dyke? Well, lately she's been seeing a man who calls himself Dr. Langley. Uh-huh. Are you of the Long Island Van Dykes? We used to live on Long Island. Why? Well, if you're the same family, you say piggy bank instead of U.S. Mint. We are quite wealthy. Uh-huh. That's like saying Scarface had a gun collection. You uh, think this Dr. Langley is after your aunt's money, is that it? Yes. He's been taking her to see a clairvoyant, and she claims that he produced her dead mother and that she talked with her. Maybe she's been getting tips on the market. My aunt says that this apparition, or whatever it is, warned her of impending danger. What's the medium's name? He calls himself Professor Leonardo. Uh Uh-huh. What else did the ghost have to say? Well, she said, or it said, to trust Dr. Langley, and that's exactly what my aunt started to do. She even consults him on matters of business. He completely sold her on this phony Professor Leonardo, and unless I miss my guess, he's got a wandering eye for her jewelry collection. She had it out, and she was showing it to him last evening. What do you want me to do? I want you to prove that this Dr. Langley and the professor are charlatans. Well, in my business, charlatan is a nice word. These guys are either legit or phony. So if you want me to find out, the fee is 100 a day in expenses. Well, I'll give you a retainer. Is 200 all right? Have you ever seen 200 that wasn't? What's your aunt's name and address? Uh, Mrs. Myrna Van Dyke, 326 Park Avenue. There's your 200, Mr. Diamond. Thank you. If you prove these men are phonies, please report it to my aunt. Then stop by my place and I'll pay you the rest of your fee. 741 Madison Avenue. Oh, uh, 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 Miss Van Dyke, did you ever model bathing suits? No, Mr. Diamond, but I have a very nice one. I got it in the south of France last season. I'll show it to you sometime. I hope it won't be on a hanger. Goodbye, Miss Van Dyke. Well, I had 200 fat clams in my little hot hand and an assignment that didn't look like it was going to be too tough to crack. I needed some information on the professor and the doctor, so I headed for the 5th Precinct Police Station and Walt Levinson's office. Yeah, what is... Oh, no. What do you want, Shamus? Why, Sergeant Otis, what will the lieutenant say when he finds your big feet all over his desk? He won't say nothing. He ain't here. Well, how'd you ever figure that out? Where is he? Out of town. Doing what? Doing his vacation, that's what. Don't tell me you left you in charge. Yeah. What's the matter with that? Hmm. If you've got a few days, I'll tell you about it. Leaving you in charge of homicide is like stopping a leaky faucet with bubble gum. I ain't in charge of homicide, wise guy, but I could do it if I had to. He just asked me to watch his office and take the call. He'd get better results with a parrot. Well, I want some information, Sergeant. Who do I see? Me. I could see more in a barrel of mud. Now, you better lay off, Gumshoe. I got instructions to throw you out if you get out of line. Oh, Sergeant, Sergeant, it's nothing personal. You've got beautiful eyes, and, oh, I love all three of them. It's just that you're, you're obnoxious. Well, okay. But you start calling me any nasty names and you go out of here, I... Uh, 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 Sergeant. Well, you do. Now, what do you want? I want your file on bunco artists. Okay. You come look up some of your relatives? Oh, that was a real garter snapper, Sergeant. Yeah, here's the file. Uh, You can do me one more favor. Look up uh, Professor Leonardo. He's a spiritualist. Oh, drunk, huh? I'll get the file. Oh, no, 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 Sergeant. In the phone book, he's like a fortune teller. Oh, one of them guys. That's right. Well, well, well. You find something? Yeah, I was looking for this guy, too. Let's see. Dr. R.L. Langley. Here is Dr. Fred Bishop. Here is Dr. Leopold Karnowski. Hey, this guy's been busy. Two convictions, bunko artist. According to this, the guy goes after old dames and gives them a good fleecing. You're positively brilliant, Sergeant. Ah, it ain't nothing. It is when you do it. Did you find the phone number of the professor? Uh, Yeah, right here. Professor Leonardo, fortune teller, and clairvoyant. Okay? Oh, want to use the phone? Uh, sure. Only leave a nickel. I wish I had your nose full of them. Professor 
Professor Leonardo's psychic sanctuary. Uh, my name's Applenocker, Harold Applenocker. I'd like to make an appointment with Professor Leonardo. Just what seems to be your problem? Well, uh, you see, it's like this. I, I have a thousand-acre hog ranch in Kentucky, and last week my brother Oni got lit up on juniper juice and fell in the water. It was a pretty deep one, and he done drowned. I was wondering if you could fix it so I could talk with him. Who recommended you to us? Ain't nobody recommended nothing. I just looked it up in the phone book. Well, the professor is rather busy, and his time is expensive. I'm afraid... Oh, shuckins. I ain't worried about money or nothing. I make 40000 a year just off in the hogs, not to mention the still I got going in the back on the hills. Still? Yeah, I got it camouflaged. Only time a revenue ever got suspicious was when he saw the moon on the door. It was backwards. The price is $50 a reading and 100 if the professor is able to contact your brother. Fine, fine. I'm going to be busy at the stockyards this afternoon, and uh, I'd like to drop around this evening if I could. How would 8 o'clock be? Just dandy. Goodbye, then, Mr. Applenocker. Uh, bye, you all. Hey, what's going on? I'm gonna ha- uh, uh, I'm gonna have my fortune told, Sergeant. If you wanna wanna come along, you can put your shoes if you wanna and come along, come oh, on, John, come you're along. You're nuts. Oh, you're just lonesome. Bye, y'all. <laughs> I left the 5th Precinct and headed for 975 Park Avenue. The way the case looked to date, I was going to be working that night, and my lovely redhead would be unhappy if she had to sit home. Sometimes you get a case that's fun, and this looked like one of those times, so I decided to take Helen with me to Professor Leonardo's. Rick, a fortune teller? Yeah, he brings the dead back, too. Want to go? If he doesn't dig up some of your old jokes. Oh, you are a vicious female. <laughs> Just for that, old Harold Applenocker is going to show up alone. Harold Applenocker? Yep, raise hogs. You know, this little figure <laughs> went to market. <laughs> Rip that tickle. Don't you and Sergeant Otis ever wear shoes? Oh, I like to run around in my bare feet. It's hot. Oh, it's only 90. What would you do on the Sahara? Don't answer that. What time are we do at this spook parlor? Oh, 8 o'clock. That's two hours. In the meantime, let's start a little seance of our own. First, you start by holding hands. Rick. Yes. Oh, are you Mr. Applenocker? Oh, yep, that's me, and this here's my girl, Little Bell. Howdy! Yes. Well, won't you come in? Professor Leonardo isn't back yet, but if you'll just be seated in here, he should be in at any moment. Well, just look at this here room. What are all them figures all over the wall? Them's... Uh, those are the signs of the Zodiac. Hey, look at there, Harold. That's a goat. Well, so it is. Bless my little pointed head. Used to raise goats, too, along with the hog. That's the professor now. Good evening, Professor. Good evening, good evening. Oh, this must be Mr. Applesocker. Uh, Apple Knocker, Professor. And here's my girl. Lulu Bell. Yeah, that's right. Howdy. Yes. <clears throat> well, Mr. Apple Knocker, I understand you want me to contact your dear departed brother. Well, he wasn't so dear, but he sure done departed. Fell in the pig waller. Of course. Now, if you'll just take these chairs around this table... Where do you want them to go? No, no. I mean, sit in them. You right here, Mr. Applenocker, and you right next to him, uh... Uh, Lulabell. Yes, Lulabell. Howdy. Yes, howdy. I-, I mean, if you please, turn off the light. Yes, Professor. Hey, Lulabell. Yeah? This is fun, ain't it? Yeah. Now, I must have complete silence, please. <laughs> Did you laugh, Mr. De Lulabell? Yes, Lula Bell. Howdy. Uh, never mind. Now, silence, please. I'm going into a trance. I call to the world beyond. I wish to speak to the spirit of only Apple Hanger. Duh, Apple Knocker. Correction, the name is Apple Knocker. <laughs> Lula Bell. Howdy. I feel your presence. Who are you, spirit? Speak. I'm Oni Applenocker. Well, Oni, how the deuce are you? Please, you break the contact. 
Well, ain't it okay if I ask him a few questions? It's not the usual procedure, but we seem to be establishing a precedent tonight. Go ahead. Hey, Orny, you remember Lola Bell, don't you? Yeah, howdy, Lola Bell. I'm very happy to make your acquaintance again, Orny. <laughs> Mr. Applenocker, you must not laugh at the spirits. Uh, the apple hunker. Apple hunker? And Lola Bell. Yes, yes, I know. Howdy. <laughs> now, wait just a moment. What's going on here? Turn on the lights. <laughs> Oh. What's the matter? These two people are laughing. Oh, I'm sorry, Professor. But I think you've been taken for that well-known ride. You mean this is some kind of a practical joke? I don't know how practical it is, but it sure got a laugh. <laughs> Professor, their accents. Yeah, they went out when poor Oni jumped up from the pig waller. Oh, I see. Well, look here, young man. I don't see the humor, and it's going to cost you just $100 for this laugh. Oh, it is, huh? Yes, yeah, so you're going to walk out of here on crutches. That's the funniest thing you said all night. What do you want, anyway? I just wanted to find out how phony you were. Now, you ought to be ashamed taking advantage of old ladies like Mrs. Van Dyke. Professor. Shut up. Who are you? The name's Diamond. Look me up sometime. I'm in the phone book under detectives. Come on, Ellen. I've got to go see the old girl and wise her up to this louse. <laughs> Helen and I left the professor and his witch and went out on the street. I hailed a cab and put Helen in it and sent her home to wait for me. Twenty minutes later, I was ringing the doorbell at the Van Dyke residence. I stopped ringing and tried my knuckles, and that's when I noticed that the door was ajar. I pushed it open and walked in. I stopped cold in my tracks. The hair on my neck jumped off and hid in the corner. Lying on the bed was what looked like a body. I couldn't tell because it was covered with a sheet. I was sure of one thing. Whatever it was, was bleeding all over the place. And the first word that came to my mind was murder. I pulled the sheet back and took a look at what could only have been Mrs. Myrna Van Dyke. She was about 60 and she was wearing a quilted house coat. She didn't have to worry about trying to button it because it was pinned together at the neck with a long knife. Well, Diamond, you sure can dig them up, can't you? Huh? Oh, Otis, how did you get here? After you left the station, I called the lieutenant and told him you'd been in and you was acting screwy. He told me to tell you. Now I'm glad I did. Oh, mess, isn't it? Yes, yeah, stabbing through. Looks like she was getting ready for bed. That's a towel around her head, ain't it? Could be her hair, but I doubt it. It says Adam's Hotel on it. Uh, let's take a look around. Oh, hey, got a load of this. What? Over here on the dressing table. Hey, ain't that a wig? It sure is. I want to look at the body again. You can't do that. You ain't supposed to touch anything. I'm just taking off this towel. Hmm, well, well, well. She's bald. Yep, nearly. Otis... Check on Professor Leonardo and Dr. Langley. Uh, they the guys you picked out of the rogues gallery this morning? Yeah. I already did. The doc lives on Charles Street, apartment 209. You mean you did all that by your little lonesome? Well, when I talked to the lieutenant, he told me to, just in case. You continually amaze me, Sergeant. Yeah. Hey, now call the wagon and get the coroner over here. Then get some of the boys to pick up the phony professor. Where are you going? Over to the good doctor's house. The body's been dead about an hour. That would, uh... Oh, that would make it between seven and eight. Now, you see if the professor's got an alibi, and I'll check back here. Hey, I don't know whether I'll let you go or not. Sergeant. Yeah? Bye. I went out and grabbed another cab for Charles Street. It was dark out, and the heavy fog was rolling in and staking a claim on the city. By the time I reached the doctor's, it was thick enough to be sliced up and sold in large economy cartons. The doc didn't answer my knock, so I went in anyway. I stumbled into a little two-room joint that looked like a chick sales architectural achievement. The doctor was not home, and neither were his clothes and toothbrush, so I started casing. I tore the place apart and came up with a big fat zero, but that was before I looked in the waste paper basket. Among the trash, I found a rental bill for a hangar and an airplane at the flyaway airport on Long Island. I grabbed the phone and called Sergeant Otis. Yeah? Otis, this is Diamond. Oh, the boys are here now. You were right about the time of death, around 7.30. What about the professor? Uh, we sent a car over to pick him up, but he skipped. We got some dame, though, and she told us that the prof was given one of them C answers from 7 to 8. Did you check it? Yeah, and you was. Good. Now check and see who gets the dead woman's money in the in event of her death. Well, how am I going to find a lawyer at this time of night? Just find him and meet me at the flyaway airport on Long Island. Okay. Did you get the doctor? That's what I'm going to do now. And if this fog keeps up, I've still got a good chance. Sometimes a case starts off like a party and ends up like a funeral. 
this was one of those times, and when it happens, you're never really prepared for it, so you've got to work fast. I used my last ten bucks, uh, besides the two hundred the girl had given me, and got to Flyaway Airport in a hurry. The fog was so heavy, I had to almost kick it aside, but I finally found the row of hangars and started looking. I reached the last hangar when I spotted the plane. It was sitting on the strip, and as I moved nearer, I could see the man. Who's that? Who is that? I got a gun out, Doctor. So just stand the way you are. Who are you? What do you want? I want that little suitcase you've got. I want to take you back to the police. Police? Oh, what on earth for? Mrs. Van Dyke is dead, been murdered. Oh. Oh, now, come on, stop that. Well, I, I know nothing about the killing. I swear I had nothing to do with it. What's in that suitcase? Why, just some clothes. Not the Van Dyke collection of jewels? Of course not. What would I want with them? Miss Nancy Van Dyke seemed to think you did. Oh, that's absurd. Here, here, you can look at the bag if you like, sir. Well, I'd like. Let's take a walk over here where we can see some light. If you insist. Where were you between 7 and 8 this evening, Doctor? Why, I was at home. Ah, now, you're a two-time loser. If you're lying, they'll wash your mouth for 20 years. You know about my record, do you? Looked it up this afternoon. Well, I suppose I may as well tell you. I wasn't home until nearly 8. Where were you? Mrs. Van Dyke's apartment. I was supposed to put her jewels in the downstairs vault. What happened? She was dead when I got there. You sure she was dead? Yes. She was lying on the bed under a sheet. Pulled it back, saw she'd been stabbed in the throat. I left, packed, came out here. I knew I'd be accused, but I didn't do it. Hold it. Here's the light. Well, if the jewels are in this bag, you're going to be in a tough spot. You're welcome to look. Thanks, Lord. Oh! Whatever it was, it caught me across the back of the head, and I went down like a dead palm tree in a hurricane. It wasn't the doctor who had lowered the boom, but someone who had sneaked up in the fog and gotten around behind me. I wasn't knocked out, and I could still hear things, so I just lay there and listened. Oh, thank goodness you came along. He was going to take me to the police because someone had killed Mrs. Van Dyke and stolen her jewels. He thought I had them. What are you doing? No! 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 I rolled over and looked at the doctor. He was very dead. I got up as fast as I could and started after the killer, but in that fog, it was like looking for a hangnail in a mine shaft. I went into one hangar after another, and I guess if you keep after it long enough, sometimes you get lucky. I went into the last hangar and stopped to listen. Okay, you, come on out. If I have to come in after you, it's going to be the hard way. Well, you're the boss. Now, why don't you stop it? You can't see me any better than I can see you, but I've got the door covered. Now, come on out. If I guess right, that's one big sergeant, and he's so stupid he's liable to shoot you. Diamond! Diamond, where are you? In here, Otis. Watch your step. We're playing cops and robbers. Yeah, what do you mean? What are you talking about? Uh, oh, cop! You all right, Otis? Yeah, but this cement's hard. Crawl over here. Okay. Hey, who, who's shooting? Well, one of two people. Just shot Dr. Langley back on the airstep. Yeah? Why don't you blast him? Well, I guess I'll have to. He doesn't want to come out. Uh, Otis, uh, uh, crawl over about 12 feet and make him shoot. Me? Yeah, I want to get a good line on him. He's behind those oil drums, and I've got to stand up to do it. Oh, all right. Hey, Diamond, now? Yes, Otis, now. <laughs> okay, like I said, you're the boss. <laughs> Hit. Come on, Otis. Good shoot. Uh, glad you liked uh, it. Well, how about you, Professor? I'm not happy. I got all three of them. <laughs> he won't be around long. Well, uh, why did you hit me, and why did you kill the doctor? I wanted the bag. I thought the jewels were in it. Aren't they? No, I opened it back here. I thought the doctor was double-crossing me. Well, if you ain't got the jewels, why'd you try to kill the old lady? I didn't. Oh, come on. This ain't no time to lie. He isn't lying, Otis. You told me yourself his alibi was good. Hey, that's right. Then who did? The one who would benefit most by the death of the woman. The one who had a perfect setup because two con artists could be blamed for it. Let's go. Yeah, what about this guy? How do you feel, Professor? Oh. Like I said, Otis, you keep. Come on, let's go. <laughs> Mr. Diamond. 
You come to see the bathing suit? I hope it comes in stripes. What? This is Sergeant Otis. Homicide. Homicide? Has someone been killed? Your aunt. Oh, no. Isn't that touching, Sergeant? Yeah. But that horrible doctor. Well, you've got to arrest him. Why would he want to do it? Why, for the jewels, of course. Now, now, put your hat on. You must have known that the doctor was going to get the jewels tonight, so you killed your aunt, knowing he'd get there and wouldn't have an alibi. Why, you're insane. The trouble was, he got so scared he ran off without him. So he had no motive. But it was a professor. Strike two. He didn't have them either. You're crazy. You can't prove a thing. I didn't stab my aunt. Uh, oh, who said she was stabbed? <laughs> well, well, I just... Something else tipped me to you. The minute I took a good look at your aunt, I knew it couldn't have been a man who'd done the job. Why not? You're just presuming. Because there were no signs of a struggle. Your aunt must have known the killer pretty well. She knew the doctor very well. Well enough to meet him with a towel around her head and her wig in plain sight on the dresser? What? Yeah. And I got in touch with a lawyer, and he said you was the sole heir to the estate. Were, Sergeant. Oh, yeah. You were the sole heir, and I'm arresting you because I were there and saw the wig. Isn't it fun at the fortune teller? Yeah, he's going to have to think up a new racket. Like contacting the living. What? No, forget it. What's to eat? I'll go look in the icebox. Bring some milk, will you, dear? Mm-hmm. If you'll play something. I'll try. Oh, no, not again! Oh, swell. Can't you get on the night shift or something? I can't get anything around here, especially sleep. Now, please, will you kindly shut your big fat face? What do you mean? I haven't sung anything yet. Oh, but you will. I just know you will. Well, if you insist. Oh, no. Please, please. I'm a nervous man. Oh, it calms you right down. Don't blame me for falling in love with you. I'm under your spell, but how can I help it? Don't blame me. Can't you see when you do the things you do? If I can't conceal the thrill that I'm feeling, don't blame me. Oh, that's pretty. Don't stop. Oh, I, I must. Food looks too good. Did I hear you talking to someone? Mm-hmm. Listen. Don't blame me for falling in love with you. I don't hear anything. Oh, that's funny. He was there a minute ago. Don't blame me for falling in love with you. I still don't hear anything. Rick, who are you calling? Sergeant Otis. I'm afraid the guy next door just cut his throat. <laughs> You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Ted Osborne, Peggy Weber, and Jack Crucian. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by Richard Sandville. And now, Dick Powell. Friends, I want to remind you of the wonderful group of programs NBC has on tap for tomorrow afternoon and evenings. Shows like Hollywood Calling... Guy Lombardo, Four Star Playhouse, and the Ethel Merman Show. For the best in radio listening tomorrow and always, keep your dial turned to your favorite NBC station. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at this same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. <laughs> This program has come to you from Hollywood. Theater Guild on the Air returns tomorrow night on NBC.